This morning, we're going to continue our uh, reflection and discussion on the Lord's Prayer. So if you have a Bible with you or you want to grab a few Bible, I'd encourage you to open up to Matthew uh, chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses, uh, well, verse uh, 11 in particular, but the, the broader passage as well. And yes, if our children want to head downstairs with our wonderful volunteers, that would be wonderful. Bye, ladies. Um, um, but last week we began this, this series uh, on prayer and, and began asking the question, why is prayer so hard, right? And, and one of the first reasons we identified last week is that prayer is, is seldom taught in the home and the church. It's that we uh, we often believe that this is just something that is automatic, that, that we just know how to do it, and therefore we seldom spend any significant time really studying and, and reflecting and asking ourselves, when is prayer effective, and, and how can I be more uh, effective in, in my prayer? And so we're slowing down intentionally to provide some of that teaching. But we also want to encourage you to take it upon yourselves to uh, educate yourselves. There's a tremendous wealth of information. There's an entire video library available on Right Now Media on the topic of prayer. And I tr encourage you to avail yourselves of it because I know this, that those who invest in learning about prayer become more prayerful. And the more prayerful you become, the more you'll know the joy of His presence and his peace. So it is definitely to our benefit to avail of ourselves of all the resources we have to, to become better prayer warriors. But we also saw last week that one of the key reasons why prayer is so difficult that in our heart we are often very selfish. Many people throughout time have used prayer as a way to demonstrate their own righteousness to others or to make themselves feel better about themselves. And though that's common, I, I don't think that's really a common issue for us. I've known you all now for almost five years, and, and I know you all to be a very humble community. That you don't think too highly of yourselves. In fact, you may think too lowly of yourselves. And this is the second challenge, is that we often shy away from public prayer or prayer in general because we are afraid we might say the wrong thing. We might sound foolish or our, our peers may think differently of us if we were actually to pray out loud. And then there's a, another thing that makes prayer so challenging is that we tend to come to prayer emphasizing our own needs, making prayer too much about ourselves and not enough about the one who it really is about, Jesus and our, and our Heavenly Father. We often believe that prayer is about getting things from God rather than just being with God. And so Jesus recognizes this, and, and last week he, he gave us a, a, a solution to this self-centeredness in our prayer, and it was, as we talked about last week, adoration. This is why Jesus tells us that when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. We adore God for who he is, his attributes, his character. We adore God because He invites us into a, a personal relationship built upon trust in Him and developed through prayer and Scripture. We adore Him because He reigns. And unlike an imperfect or evil earthly ruler, He reigns with mercy and compassion. He, he reigns with true justice and true righteousness. And so the beginning of all our prayers should be exclusively about God. Because if they are not, then it's probably going to be very, not probably, it will be very difficult for us to come into His presence with the right spirit, a humble spirit, a worshipful spirit. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to see how Jesus transitions the Lord's Prayer from an emphasis onto Him to the emphasis on the individual, the one praying. And we're going to see that God truly does care about our needs. 
Yes, He knows what we need before we even ask, but He still cares. We're going to see that He is concerned about our eternal need, right? Forgiveness of sin. And, and we're also going to see that He's very, very concerned about our present spiritual victory. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, the Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer to be recited, but it's a model of prayer that leads people into a robust conversation with God. And it should demonstrate to you, as it demonstrates to me, that God has an everlasting desire to deal with me as a whole person. That he desires to bring his healing, his ministry, his presence, his peace to my entire person. I, you, we are of great eternal value to God. And prayer leads us into a deeper understanding. So before we go any further, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now as your children who desire to know you, to be close to you, so that we may know your will for our lives and the strength to walk faithfully in that will. We believe and hold to the truth that your will for us is best. Even when it is challenging, even when there is pain, we know that your will is good, perfect, and intended to bless. Help us now, Lord, as we come to your word to clearly understand it. Holy Spirit, I am so thankful that you will take these words and place your power behind them to lead us into a deeper understanding and a better relationship with you. So, Father, whatever is true, let that remain. And that which is not, let it be forgotten quickly. Again, we say thank you for the relationship we have with you through Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. And when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will you or your Father forgive you your trespasses. Let's return first to the beginning where Jesus says to pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And our focus for today, verse 11 Give us this day our daily bread. Now this section of prayer, this, this, this little bit, gives us three things uh, to help us have this robust conversation with God. Not a check-in, not a quick text to let us know that we're doing okay or that we got home safe, but a robust, deep, meaningful, life-giving conversation. Three things. First, a robust conversation with God is for His children and His children alone. The only prayer God hears and answers from those who are not His children is this. God, save me. God, deliver me from my sin. Not everyone you meet, contrary to the world's opinion, 
is a child of God. Yes, we are all created by God, but until we come to Him through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are not counted among His children. Listen to this verse from John 1, verse 11 through 13. He came to His own, speaking of Jesus, and His own people did not receive Him. In fact, they rejected Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will, or of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Similarly, Paul writes in Romans 10, 9 through 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is what it means to come to faith in Jesus. This is what it means to become a child of God, that we recognize that I cannot earn my way into God, God's good graces or earn my way into heaven because I am a sinner. Let me repeat that. I am a sinner. Let's say this together. It's somewhat freeing to admit something that is true. I am a sinner. We receive Jesus for who he is. Our Savior, again, we cannot save ourselves. We need our Savior. He is the only one who can save us from the ruin and the doom and the gloom of sin. We believe that He is our Lord, the one who has the right to direct our lives. We believe that His death, burial, and resurrection is proof that He is who He said He was, the Savior of the world, and that God dealt with sin on the cross. I say this because not everyone you meet is a child of God. And in fact, there might be individuals in this room that have really never come to God and said, save me. There might be individuals at home watching that have never really come to God and say, God, I need you. I cannot save myself. Because prayer, the type of prayer that Jesus is teaching us, is first and foremost for his children. And there's some implications to this, some really good news to this. And the first one is this, that as God's children, God is eager to listen. Listen to this verse again, these these seven verses. Words, give us this day our daily bread. Day and daily, it's emphatic. God's desire is for his children to come before him on a daily basis and ask, request, let be known their daily needs. He already knows him. Before we even ask, before we are even aware of them, he knows them. And yet, he still desires and eagerly beckons us to say, come and spend this time with me. First, reflect on who I am, what I have done, and my goodness, and enter into my presence knowing my peace, and then spend time with me. I want to hear you. A second aspect of being his children and coming to him in prayer is this, that God delights in answering and providing for his children. It's throughout all of Scripture. Here's just a smattering of examples. Psalm 84, verse 11, For the Lord God is the sun and shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
Again, perhaps the most famous psalm, Psalm 23. Listen to his provision. Listen to his desire to provide. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his own namesake. And Jesus, rather emphatically, just a, a few pages, or not even a page, just, just turn your Bible. It's in the same sermon, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. But listen to this. Or, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you good things to those who ask him? God desire is to hear your prayers and God's delight is to answer them. God is eager in hearing and delights in answering our prayers. However, this also brings to clarity, perhaps, why prayer is such a struggle. And it has to do with this. We, understandably slow, judge our heavenly Father by the experiences with our earthly Father. Let me say that again. We judge our heavenly Father by our experiences with our earthly Father. Here's the unfortunate truth about living on earth. Our earthly fathers are imperfect. Many are distracted or do not make themselves available to their children. Sadly, many fathers are found to be abusive, whether that's physical, emotional, neglect, sexual, many fathers are abusive. And sadly, many fathers are not even present. They've abandoned their families, their children, their responsibilities. And because of this, Many of us, and again, understandably so, but incorrectly believe that God does not care. If my earthly father didn't really give a rip about my needs, my concerns, my hurts, then why would God care? Or he won't deliver, he, he won't provide, he won't answer. Or even most, more devastatingly is that he's not even someone I want to bring my needs to. Because again, I'm judging, I'm picturing my heavenly father as if he was my earthly father. Now, in our head, we understand that this is not true, right? We, we see on every single page a merciful, compassionate, loving, steadfast, faithful, enduring God whose great desire is to, del or whose great delight is to provide for his children. And yet that knowledge hasn't made it into our heart. It's, it's broken and, and needs some repair. Perhaps you're the individual who had a really good father, and this isn't a struggle for you. For that, I, I, I say amen. I had a, I had a wonderful father a great provider. He still is a great provider. I spoke of him as he's in the past tense. He's still alive. He's a great father, a great provider. And we have a wonderful relationship. But Dick Baker is an imperfect man. And one of the greatest experiences that I've gone through in my spiritual maturity is removing the image of Dick Baker from the image of my heavenly Father. 
seeing him for who he is and believing in him for who he is and not filtering him through the lens of my own father. So with that, I want us to just take a moment and we're going to pray. And so perhaps you are that individual who has never really come to God and asked to be his child. This is that moment for you. If you're feeling that pull, you're feeling that nudge, this is your opportunity to respond to the work of the Holy Spirit on your heart to say, yes, I want to be forgiven. Yes, I believe in your son, Jesus. If you are his child, this is this prayer I want you to pray. This is how I want you to interact with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to see you for who you really are. Help me to strip away the filter, the lens that I see you through my earthly father and see you for who you really are, how you have presented yourself to me in the scriptures. I want to be close to you. I want to know you. Let us pray. Father God, we we come before you now recognizing that it is Awesome to be your child. But that we do this imperfectly. So Lord, in these few moments as we reflect, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly to those who desire to be known as your children, that they would hear your invitation clearly and that they would humbly confess their need for you as a Savior and their belief in the work of the cross. Pray, Lord, for those who do know you as their father. Let this be a moment of ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of prayer, that you are a God of conversation, that you are a God who speaks to us through your word and in times of prayer. We pray, Lord, that we pray that even when we're outside of the sanctuary, even when we're outside of a time that we have set apart to listen and to hear your voice, that we would still be able to listen and hear your voice. That just as we carve out time today, we would carve out time throughout the week to be with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you, if, if you did pray that prayer for the first time, God, save me. I, I, want, I want to encourage you either to come to me or a friend or a family member that's here and let them know. It's like, listen, I prayed this prayer for the first time. Can you help me become more mature? Can you help me grow? If you are a child of God and you're beginning to recognize that your relationship with your heavenly Father has been marked more by your relationship with your earthly Father than who He has presented Himself to be, then I would encourage you to visit with a friend and to begin praying that prayer with them. Find someone who can walk with you in this time of of, of ministry to help pull apart the imperfections that we place upon God based upon our earthly father's example. Those type of relationships are life-giving, and I hope you will find one. So, for the rest of our time, though, let's focus on three more lessons from the Lord's Prayer and Daily Bread, right? Give us this day our daily bread. God's children live one day at a time. Following this prayer, Jesus says, do not be anxious 
about anything, what you will eat or, or, or what you will wear, but trust that God will provide. And his final instruction in, in chapter 6, verse 33, is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So a bit of context, some cultural understanding. The, the culture of the day is your children were your 401k. The culture of the day is that your children were your social security payments and your pension pay, pay, payments. The culture of the day is that the children would look after their parents in the old age. The culture of the day is that the laborer was paid at the end of the day. You didn't have to wait a week or two weeks. It's actually quite funny that if you go to Wendy's, as I will today on my way up to Maine to get my $5 biggie bag, they're hiring and promising work today, get paid today. Right, so we're kind of seeing a return back to that to try and encourage people to come to appointment. But, but back to the point of this passage. Not about the $5 biggie bag. It's not about Wendy's, but sorry. The culture of the day was there was this immediate sense of, of, of payment. And God's reflection here is to remind them, is like, listen, today is covered. If you work today, you will get paid today. If you need bread today, you will receive bread today. I've got you covered. Now, the culture of our day is, isn't so much that our kids are our 401k or our pension plan or our, our social security fact. In fact, the culture of our day is we, we work hard and we save so that we don't have to burden our children. Neither one is right or wrong or good or bad. It's just the culture and the expectation of the day. So what Jesus isn't saying is don't plan don't save. Like, that's not what he's saying. He's like, it's good to save. It's good to plan. It's right to do so. But do not become so consumed with tomorrow that you forget about the purpose of today. For the day is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God offers salvation to the world. Today is the day that he offers forgiveness for sin. Today is the day that he offers healing. Today is the day where you, his children, his workmanship, where we get to do that work. And by including this, give us this day our daily bread, he's reminding his hearers and us today that our God is a God of provision so that his children can be children of proclamation. God provides so that his children can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And yet so many of us, myself included, and I'm the professional Christian, get caught up in distractions of today and distractions of tomorrow and forget that the job that he has given every one of us as his children is to be his proclaimers. So we must not be too consumed with tomorrow because he has given us the privilege of spreading his word today. Number two, God's, or three rather, sorry, God's children are to pray for one another. The prayer that he gave us was not, give me this day my daily bread. It is, give us this day our daily bread. Again, our culture today is extremely individualistic. We focus on the individual. Much of our language within the church is about the individual. We want you to have a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is absolutely true. But the culture of the kingdom is not about the individual, but it's about the community. The Bible is about, or the New Testament, a significant portion about it, is about God's gift to the world being the church and his children coming together and living as a family, supporting one another, growing with one another, and going out into the world to declare the gospel. Yes, we have a personal relationship with Jesus and he desires for us to have that, but again, the emphasis on kingdom culture is community. Listen to this passage. It's a popular passage, but just listen to it. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8. This is Paul speaking. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Again, as a community, as a broad, diverse group of people, have one heart, have one mind. Do not, and here comes the instruction. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Look, each of you, not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I can't wait till we get to the letter to the Philippians so that we can spend two years just in these eight verses. Just kidding. But there is a profound lesson to be learned. That as his children, we ought to live and act and be like Christ. And Christ was about the other. He came to serve. He, he came to give. And he came to help the other. It doesn't say that we, don't, that we disregard our needs and our own interests, but that we are not to only look to them. This prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is an encouragement to the church to play, pray together and to intercede for one another. Here's the truth about our community. We're well off. We're rich. We have had our needs provided to us tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. But how much of our prayer life, our time spent with God, is praying for the other person? And I mean like the other person, not just the, the family member, but by name, going through the pews. When you're aware of a need, Praying for that need, interceding on that person's behalf, bringing that individual, bringing that family before the throne of grace and saying, God, give them their daily bread. God, give them the thing that is necessary for today. God, give them your presence. God, give them your bread. God, give them your living water. God, give them. Give us this day our daily bread is an encouragement to, ch to the children of God to pray for one another. Earlier, we, we talked about the difficulty of prayer if it's often kind of focused too much on the self. And, and this was a common thing among the day. James, the brother Jesus, writing to the, the, the Jewish Christians who had fled, writes this in chapter 4 of James. You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and can obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. I mean, that's a pretty alarming statement about Christians in that time, right? Like, you don't have, so you steal, and, you know, and it's kind of alarming. But hear this phrase, hear this sentence, hear this verse. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Again, I'm not criticizing anyone or, or trying to critique, but it serves as a, as a warning and a statement of fact that as fallen men and women, we are apt to make prayer mostly about ourselves when it should chiefly be about God and chiefly about others. To intercede on their behalf, to know the needs of your neighbor, and to pray for them, to know the needs of your enemy, and to pray for them. Finally, number four. Ooh. 
excuse me. God's, in, God's children understand that they need more than physical bread. God wants and delights in providing his children, not just with their physical needs, but with their spiritual needs. Just as this prayer communicates to us that we are dependent on God for our daily physical needs, we are also dependent on God for our daily spiritual needs. In the Bible, bread is a common metaphor for, yes, our, our physical, for bread, or, but our physical necessities of food, shelter, clothing, etc. But it is also a reference to our spiritual need. Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word that comes from God's mouth. In John chapter 6, verses 32 and 35, Jesus says this to them, truly, truly, emphatic, saying pay attention, listen to what I'm about to tell you because this is critically important. Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not go hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Just as we are dependent on God for our physical needs, we are absolutely dependent upon Him for our spiritual needs. This is why I'm so thankful that Robin is, is beginning this new uh, Sunday school class on these, on these disciplines, these, this, this exploration of how do we connect to God. Because again, we, we learn how to read and we learn somehow some how to interpret and how to understand Scripture, but that's all head stuff. Very few of us take time to learn and understand how God has designed us to connect to His heart. So that when we come to Him seeking to abide in His presence, we receive the goodness of His Spirit. That, that joy, that, that love, that, that beauty, that, that peace that only comes from being in His presence. The children of God understand that when Jesus speaks of bread, He's not just speaking of bread but about the very presence of His Spirit in our lives. A rich, healthy, vibrant faith comes from cultivating a rich, healthy, vibrant relationship with God. And He has provided all that we need for this. He has provided His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross and on the throne. His Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in truth and righteousness. His Word to instruct us, to teach us, to shape us, to mold us. His church to build us up. And prayer. Prayer. So we can spend time in the presence of the God of peace knowing the peace of God. God's desire is to have a robust conversation with his children. You could say that God's love language is quality time, not quantity. I mean, he's got all the love languages there, but like, like this one's emphasizing the quality, right? He doesn't want the check-in. He doesn't want the text at 11 o'clock knowing that you got home okay. He wants his children to, to sit with him to celebrate Him, not because He needs it, but because He knows that when we celebrate Him, when we adore Him, the insecurities, the anxieties, the worries of life run off like, duck off, like water off of a duck's back. And that we can truly receive His gift of presence, His peace, His majesty. It's then when we can come before Him with a humble heart and say, Lord, thank You for how You have provided. Would You care for this family just as You've cared for me? Will You help this individual just as You have helped me?
This week, as you go on with your time, I want you to reflect on that question or this question of how is the quality time with God? If it's fresh and vibrant and life-giving, then, then praise God. Celebrate that. But then look for the person who is struggling and ask them if you can come alongside them to pray with them and to help them experience that freshness, that vibrancy, that life-giving that you're enjoying. If it's lacking, if your relationship with God is, is lacking, if it's, if it's drying up, if it's without passion, without vim and vigor, then, then perhaps consider that you might be judging your heavenly father by the actions of your earthly father. And you need to spend some time with someone else and with God stripping that away. Perhaps you do not recognize that, that God's purpose in supplying your needs is to empower you to share your faith. I mean, think of it this way. If I have tap water and I, and I pour it into a, a bucket with a spigot, I can only fill it up so much. And, and eventually, just over time, that, that water is going to become stale and stagnant. If I, if I leave it outside, algae will grow and it will become undrinkable. But if I get fresh water in there and I'm constantly pouring it out to refresh another, God is always supplying new water. And yet for many of us, we've closed off the spigot. And the good water that God has given us has grown stale. And so perhaps reflect on that. And evaluate. How am I sharing my faith with my family and my friends? Have I received the goodness of his grace and his mercy and kept it to myself? Perhaps your water has grown stale. Or perhaps you need to begin praying intentionally for others, to be interceding more for others than you do for yourself. I had a conversation with a woman of our church who, because of her situation, is no longer able to attend us. And, and she asked, Steve, what can I do? I'm... I'm I'm stuck here. And I encouraged her. Here you have the directory of the people that are part of your church family. Begin praying for them by name. Begin sending them cards of encouragement. Begin leaving them messages on their phone. Just, but, but just pray for them. And after about a month and a half or so, she calls me back with a wonderful story about how praying for others has brought new life to her faith, has brought passion to her faith, and that she never thought praying for others could be so fun, could be so enjoyable, and could be so life-giving. So this week, as you leave from here and go about your day and your time, I want to encourage you, examine the quality of your relationship with God. Is it vibrant? Is it fresh? Is it life-giving? Again, I say amen. Find someone else you can help because that's our job too. But if you're struggling, then begin to wrestle with the things that were brought up today. And don't do it alone. Find someone who will walk with you, someone who will pray with you, and the three of you spend time with God. His desire, His delight is to provide for his children and to give us good and perfect gifts. In a moment, our worship team is going to come up and conclude our service with a song. I want to invite those who would like some prayer to just to, to come forward. It could be for something significant or something that you believe is rather small, but I want to encourage you, if you would like prayer, Pastor Robin and I are going to be right here to pray for you. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much that your desire is to spend quality time with your children. And we thank you that your prayer, this example that Jesus has given us, is not just something to, to recite, but it's something to instruct us, to teach us, to, to help us have this robust conversation. So Father God, again, I say, would you center our hearts and minds on adoration? 
so that when we enter into your presence, we're entering into your presence with a humble heart. And as we pray, let us know that you love to hear. Help us to know that you delight in answering, that you are not a stingy God who withholds, but that your word promises that you do not hold back. That if we ask, you will give. And you will provide us with what we need. Thank you for being our Father. It is in your name we pray. Amen.